to the topic of design. Uh, one of your assignments relates to defining some qualities of a well-designed or the flip side, I suppose, is a poorly designed web page. So we want to talk about these and we want to get some idea and some notions in our head of, of what constitutes a well-designed and a poorly designed web page. Um, all right, on to the loose ends. Um, last time I talked about validating um, the HTML in, in the code validator. And if you recall, I went to the W3 schools. Uh, not W3 schools, I'm sorry, W3C.org. W3Schools is a unrelated tutorial, but the W3C.org is actually the, the people that create the specifications. And they have, if you look over here on the side, they have a series of validators. So we talked about validating your HTML code. Um, one thing I will say again, uh, to repeat, is that The errors it gives you are not always necessarily clear. In other words, <clears throat> keep in mind that this is a, a computer that is, or a computer program that is looking through your code and trying to look for violations of rules. So it does it in a very brute force sort of mechanical way. Which means the implication of that is that um, it may not necessarily explain the error message in a in a obvious sort of way. So sometimes it takes a little bit of interpretation for you to um, get exactly what it's saying. The other thing to remember is, is sometimes it gives you an error in very approximate sort of terms. In other words, it won't say, hey, you forgot an ending tag. It will say, hey, I see this starting tag where I don't expect it. Well, that's its way of saying, well, it expects to see something else. What does it expect to see? It expects to see a uh, ending tag, perhaps. So, the other thing that we have a validator for is we have a validator for our CSS. And this validator is especially good if you are running into difficulties and your CSS isn't working the way that you'd expect it to. Let's take a look at an example that we had a couple times ago. There we go. Um, this page. All right. If you remember, we had in this page a external style sheet, I believe. There's our HTML page. We used an external style sheet file that looked like this. And just as we can run our HTML code through a validator, we can run our CSS code through a validator. So we can go here click on CSS, same sort of thing. We can upload our file, or we can point to an address on the web, or we can use direct input. I'm going to go in and copy my CSS from here into the validator. And actually it found, um, found five errors. Um, and let's take a look. Uh, let's see. Background transparent is not a background value. Even though it shows up as an error, this code is put in there for browsers that have issues with the proper way of doing things. So I'm going to let that error go. 
All right, I'm not necessarily going to remove uh, that error because, again, this is for us a fallback for browsers that don't support um, the particular syntax, the syntax where we can set the transparency. Attempt to find a semicolon after the property name. That's on line 13. So that would be on this line. It's complaining about the fact that there's actually a colon here. Again, this is given the fact that this is a workaround. I'm going to leave that go. And finally, this is also sort of a, a hack, if you will, for Microsoft earlier versions of Internet Explorer. And it has some problem with that. So again, I'm not going to worry about it and let it go. This might not have been the best example to check this out with, given, given the fact that there's, there's some code in there that were put in for some specific browser situations that's sort of non-standard. All right. Again, remember that it's your job to make things work, and if browsers don't support the standard things, there's clever web developers have developed all sorts of workarounds for that. So in this particular case, um, there's some workarounds to get around the, the issues with diff how different browsers implement transparency. Let me go and get rid of all the code that relates to transparency. And we'll validate that instead. So let me go and I'll delete this part off and I'll save it. And did I save it? Hey, let's look at this one instead. Let's look at style two. That one looks a little simpler. Right there, I got rid of the transparency. And we'll look at style two. And we'll validate it. And congratulations, no errors found. All right. Now, this is good for sort of the first line of testing of browser compatibility. All right. Again, we've seen in the previous example that an error doesn't mean that your code isn't going to work. But an error is a sign that something's wrong. And you should take a minute to scrutinize it to make sure that, like in my case, I know I did that deliberately. So it's OK for me to bend the rules in that case. In other cases, it's just a flat out error that you made. You maybe you made a typo or whatever, in which case that that's something you want to go back and correct. This can also be very valuable in debugging your CSS. For example, let's say I wanted the block quote tag. I wanted this stuff to be a little bit bigger. But I made a typo. And instead of M, I just said, uh, instead of EM, I just said the letter M. All right. If I did this, I would look and I'd say, well, hey, that text isn't any bigger. I thought I said to make it bigger. Well, what you could do in that case is you could run your code through the validator and it'll tell you what you got wrong. In this case, it found an error. And it says what it is. Actually, that's not the error I expected. Let's 
make a bigger mistake. All right. There, notice it, it knows that what I have in for font size isn't a valid value. So I looked, oh, I must have fell asleep and dozed off on the keyboard. I can put the right value in there, and we're back to business. All these things are your first line of defense for browser compatibility errors. All right. Um, just because your page passes validation doesn't mean that your page is going to be browser compatible, and it certainly doesn't mean that your page is well designed. Think of it like a, a term paper passing uh, you know, a grammar check or a spell check. You could, you could write nonsense, but you've spelled every word correctly. <laughs> All right. Uh, plus, in web pages, there's the extra dimension of that a uh, different browser may implement what is normally correct code and may implement it incorrectly. So there's nothing that beats actually testing it. All right. Now, Testing is a whole topic into itself, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, in general, you should try to test your page on as many browsers as you can. All right? And again, keep in mind when I say browser, I don't just mean Internet Explorer or Firefox or Opera or whatever. I'm talking about specific versions of them and specific platforms. So in other words, Firefox on Mac is a different application than Firefox on Windows. And Firefox or, or Internet Explorer uh, version 8 is different than Internet Explorer version 9. So you do your best to do this. Now, on, in a bigger organization, sometimes they have a little usability uh, lab set up where they have machines with a whole bunch of different browsers installed that you can go and test that. All right? If you're not working in a big organization, um, usually what I do is I will contact all my friends. You know, test this page on your browser. Tell me if you run into problems. That's certainly not a comprehensive test, but at least, you know, it, at least, um, you know, you, you cover a wider range maybe than you could um, on your own. What do you do if you find a problem? First of all, you decide if the problem is something that you need to address. All right? If I find, if, if a friend of mine is running an ancient computer that's been in mothballs for months and they just brought it out and is running Internet Explorer 5.0 or something really old, and someone says, hey, um, you know, if I look at it and it doesn't look exactly the way I intended, if it's still workable, I'm inclined to let it go. In other words, it's good, it, how, how do I want to put this? In other words, the aim isn't necessarily to get a page that's going to look identical across all browsers. Um, simply, older browsers don't have some capabilities that newer browsers have. So if that's your goal, it's going to be very difficult to achieve. Your aim is to make your page workable across a bunch of different platforms. The other thing that you have to consider is at, uh, at a certain point is um, what percentage of the population uses a particular browser. So for example, if you see something that's like, wow, I'd really like to fix that, but upon inspection you realize that only a very tiny percent of the people uh, out there use a particular browser, you have to make that call. Is it worth it spending the effort trying to fix that if a small percentage, uh, uh, if only a small per percentage uses the browser for which there's a problem? Um, Again, so when you run into these errors, the question becomes how bad, how big of an error is it? You know, is it something that makes the page unworkable or is it simply a small cosmetic issue? And then what the percentage is. The more severe the error, of course, you're going to try to fix it. If it's not really an error, but the, it just looks a little different between a different browser, then you have to make that decision. And one of the things that would guide your decision is, is how, what percentage of people um, use a particular browser. All right. So that's sort of my take on it. You'll get a variety of different opinions on that. Uh, there's, you'll, if, you, if you read through uh, websites that talk about uh, you know, web design and cross-browser compatibility, you'll see a lot of different 
formulas and views and, 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 and ways of going about approaching that problem. Now, there are tools available to make cross-browser compatibility testing easier. So, if I go and I Google cross-browser compatibility, or cross-browser testing, All these, all these uh, things want me to sign up. Let's go to one that has a demo that we can just look at. This, for example, runs and you run a page and it tests it across all these different browsers. And it, what we'll do is it'll essentially show you a screenshot. Let's look at this. This is a review. Ah, here we go. This is the one I was looking for. So let's type in LC's web page. Now this is going to take a while to do. But I submit the name of the web page. And it will go and it will run through all these different browsers. And eventually... It's going to come up with... 144 browsers that we selected and over here is where they're going to start to appear as time goes on. Now a lot of these places um, you'd have to have your, your page out on the internet with a URL to test them. Um, there, are, there is software that you can purchase um, and, and many of these offer where you could test a certain number of pages a day and then beyond that you have to pay. So this is an option as well, and there's any number of different tools. We'll kind of let this run in the background, and we'll, we'll come back to it later on. Maybe by the end of class it, it will have made it through um, some browsers where we could take a look at it. Questions? Okay, let's, let, let's just let that chug along and we'll look at it towards the end of class. All right, um, we're at the point of the semester where we know enough HTML and we know enough CSS to start thinking about our project. All right, to be sure there's more HTML for us to study and there's, there's definitely more CSS to study. But we're at the point where we're... we're um, ready to talk about that. So over the next few days, what we're going to do is, first of all, talk about designing a, web, uh, a website. All right? Designing web pages, maybe even prior to that, then designing a website. And then the process that we're going to go through to, to get to there, to, to get to 
our goal of having a, a good, well-designed website. All right. Let's brainstorm for a while and let's come up with um, some ideas of what makes for a well-designed web page. So what are your thoughts? If someone were, I mean, this is a case where everyone has an opinion, right? Whether you're an expert or not. You know, just like everyone has an opinion of what good music is, even though they may never played a note in their life, right? They're not an expert in it, but they know what they like. What do you like in a website? What is, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Let's, let's make a, let's, let's put some of these things in a document. So you said easy or simple? Easy to find the easy to what well, easy to find the things I want. Easy to navigate. Those might be slightly different, or they might be the same thing. I don't know. Um, any other observations? What makes for a well-designed website, or web page, or website? Relevant content. And what do you mean by relevant content? If I'm going to a website in which I want to know about cars, I don't want to, I don't want to get content that is finding. Okay. All right. Statement was is if you were looking about cars, you wouldn't want information. If you were looking about cars from, say, a mechanical perspective, you wouldn't want to see information about how to finance a car. All right, so um, relevant content, good way to put that. Anything else? Well, we might be able to phrase things different ways. And, and keep in mind that some of these things that we, that we list may be the way that we achieve some of the other things. Like, for example, simplicity and consistency definitely go hand in hand, right? Um, if the page looked different, or if every page on the site looked radically different, that's not a very simple site. So uh, consistency is one thing that helps us lead to simplicity and so on. So it's okay to put these, because these are all like different slants maybe on the same theme. So it's okay to have all these different perspectives. Anything else? Okay, images? Again, that are related to the topic, and I'm, I'm glad you added that in, right? Um, images can go a long way in a page. You know, for example, discussing about a page about an automobile. Um, you know, or, or I'll use a real life example. My, my sister just got a dog from the Animal Protective League, all right? And I guess, you know, Prior to it, they looked online to see what dogs were available and all that. Now, you could have how many words to describe what a dog looks like? Well, it's about, you know, two feet high, and it's sort of a brindle, and, it, you know, it's got, got kind of a big nose. You, you know, you could write a book on what a dog looks like. Is that going to be effective as just putting a picture of the dog up there that you look at and say, okay, yeah, that's, that's the dog, you know? Uh, the, the old cliche is a picture's worth a thousand words. Now, what I will say, though, all right, is that in terms of web development, a picture better be worth a thousand words because it's certainly taking up far more than a thousand times the bandwidth of a, a block of words, all right? That's where related or relevant or um, other words that describe the same thing, tacked in front of the word images, really makes the thought complete. Yes, we want to have images, but we want to make sure that they truly add value to the page, all right? That they truly add value to the page, all right? For example, you know, thinking of the Animal Protective League site, um, they happen to have one image of the dog, and that's fine, all right? 
Maybe two images would be good, but if they had like 50 images of the dog, that would get to be overkill, right? It wouldn't add anything to the page. Everything that you could learn about that dog by looking at a picture, you'd learn within a picture or two, right? So again, you want to avoid doing that. Why do you want to avoid doing that? For two reasons, two big reasons why you'd want to limit the images. Number one is the bandwidth issue, right? If you go and look out how big the files are, you know, your HTML pages are tiny compared to an image. All right? Even a small image that would be, say, 50 kilobytes, that's going to be way bigger than most of your typical web pages. All right? The second reason is a reason of focus. And I guess the flip side of focus is distraction. Right? The more things you have on the page, the more scattered a person's focus is going to be. All right? If I really want to show something and I have one image on the page, you're not going to miss that one image. If I have one really important image, you're not going to miss it. If I have that one image in a page that has 20 images, I'm liable to miss the most important image or the best image or the image that really tells a story. All right? So anything you put on the page has the potential of distracting people from everything else that you put on the page. So therefore, you definitely want to use images because images can really communicate stuff that words struggle with. But you want to be careful in selecting the images that you use. You want to limit yourself to appropriate images both for the band bandwidth issue and for the issue of focus. Other qualities of a good web page or a good website. You know what? Human nature being as it is, sometimes it's easier to criticize than to praise. So let's flip the coin. All right. What are qualities of a bad web page? What makes a web page bad? Yes. Okay, hard to read. So I'll put a header for good up here. And when you say hard to read, what, what do you mean? Because that could be interpreted a couple different ways. Okay. Inappropriate font size or and or color. All right. So for example, yellow type on a white background would be very difficult to read. Or too small a font. Or maybe even the font face itself doesn't work, at least not at the size that it's being used. All these things are important. So having proper contrast, I guess the good size, the good if we're going to flip this negative into a positive, what we would want is proper contrast between text and background. Now we already ran into this, if you remember when we did the flag and we put things up against the flag. Some of the text didn't show up very well against the flag. So we've already seen uh, an instance of that. All right. Um, proper size of the font and proper font face. In other words, the particular font that we're going to use. Um, does anyone have Netflix here? Yeah. A few of you? Um, one thing that's really interesting as far as fonts is there's a movie, there's a documentary actually called Helvetica that's about typography and fonts. And they talk about fonts and it's funny because you know you can pick the most innocent issue in the world and humans being as they are are going to sit and argue about it right doesn't matter what the issue is you know people are going to argue about people find something to argue about and in Helvetica I won't say argue debates may be a better word because it's not like they were they, they were you know getting ready to fist fight or anything all right but in the movie Helvetica sort of the issue that was being debated is 
whether the font should be simply readable or should it be expressive. Now what do I mean by expressive fonts? I mean fonts that help communicate a mood, for example. All right? Um, versus fonts that are very plain and straightforward and are, are readable. Do you have any thoughts on that? What do you shoot for in fonts? Is, is creating a mood with your font important or is simply having your font readable? Okay, depends on the context. Excellent answer. If someone asked me the question, that's what I'd give it. And not just because I'm you know, practicing to be a politician or anything like that, but almost always, when you have a question of design, you have to consider the context that you're putting it in. All right? It is going to be much different if you're developing a website for children than if you're developing a website for business professionals. Or if you're developing a website for students in a particular area versus if you're developing a website for experts in that particular area and so on down the line. Um, if you're developing a website for a, some sort of entertainment thing, then maybe the font is going to be there to help create a mood, for example. But if you're developing maybe a more straightforward business site about some nonprofit organization that you want people to donate to, maybe simplicity and legibility is the key. So the interesting thing about web design is we can list as many of these guidelines as we want to, but we could probably, if we thought hard enough, think of exceptions to that. All right? And why are there exceptions? Because each project is its own sort of individual thing. So, you know, we can make some general statements, you know, um, but there's always going to be exceptions. Let me find an example of what I mean by an expressive font. Here, here's some examples. Font new grasshopper. Matchbox and match match matchbook and matchbook serif. Matilda. Wow. Yeah, no kidding. When could you use something? When, if, if, you were, if you're going to use something like this, what situation might you, you find a font like this useful? Um, <laughs> target audience on LSD was the one statement. Uh, I don't know about that. But the other, other statement, young, hip, on a t-shirt. Why on a t-shirt? I, 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 like, I like that. I, I like your answer as well. But I also like the answer on a t-shirt. Why? Why on a t-shirt? Because it's fashionable. All right. You're going for a certain look as almost as much as you're, you're going for the words. So maybe if I had a headline, one, or, or like a banner, one big word and not a lot of text. Like, for example, you wouldn't want a site's frequently asked questions to be done in this font, right? Because it would be impossible to read. You'd never get any information. But maybe part of a logo, it might be reasonable to use a font like this. There's That's a little hard to read because of the image. Cabin. Oh, I like that. It's plain, simple. Pacifica. Now,
One thing to keep in mind, too, with these is almost anything that we say, a dash of is good, but too much of it is going to be overkill. All right? So, in looking back at those fonts, and I think we talked about this before, you know, we can make everything on the page have a different font, but is that a good idea? Probably not. We want things to be consistent and simple. All right. Having too many fonts sort of defeats the purpose of that. On the other hand, there's a fine line where simple crosses over to become boring. There's elegant simple, and then there's, there's boring simple. You know, A piece of paper with one word on it is simple, but it might cross the line and become boring simple. All right. So, it's okay to vary your fonts a bit, but don't take it over the top and don't go too far. If you're going to use expressive fonts or more involved fonts, use them very sparingly. Again, in most cases, use them for banners, use them for headlines. Make sure they're readable at the size that you're putting them on, and then use a more plain functional font for maybe the bulk of the text. Same thing with colors. Colors are great. Colors can be used to emphasize things. You can use colors to organize the page in the user's mind. If they see a block of gray off to the side, they know something special about that. But you want to use it sparingly. All right. Other comments about what makes either for a well-designed or a poorly designed page. When it's hard to find. All right. If it has a really long URL, www.why don't you visit my website today? Gotcha. Okay. All right. That's not really of the focus of this, uh, this class, but that's a great observation if you have a goofy URL. All right. Um, and it's funny. You can almost see who like, got into the web early. All right, because they got the really cool URLs and the real simple e URLs. You know, Barnes and Noble is like bn.com, right? You don't have to rem remember. Is it Barnes and Noble or Barnes Noble at bn.com? You know. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. The, the other thing I would say too is, is grammar. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, using the spell check, making sure that, that the grammar is there. That makes for a good website. Okay. Statement was is, is good grammar and, and spelling and so far makes for a good website. Or maybe is an ingredient in a, we, a good website. All right. Um, why is that? If it's professional, it, it, makes, it makes me feel like I can trust the company. Okay. It lends to the credibility of, of the site. So that would be a big thing. Yes. That's an excellent point. Um, it, you know, the rules of grammar and spelling weren't created just to, to torture kids in school, right? Grammar and spelling were created to make things clear. The way that sentences are structured and all that are geared to making them clear and making sure there's no ambiguity, all right? Or less ambiguity. You can never totally eliminate it, all right? Therefore, following good grammar will help make your message more clear and, and will make it so that it's clear what you mean. Um, and that's an excellent point. All right. Don't use the you know. Don't use uh, you know. Don't use a nine dollar words. Or as my favorite expression is, is never use a big word when a diminutive one will suffice. All right. Um, is there a difference between writing for the web and writing like a magazine article? 
we said good grammar and all that, and that's true. You'd want to have good grammar in both cases. But is there a difference in, in writing for the web versus writing for? I think so. Because, um, How so? Context, that's where context comes in again, because some websites, um, it does have like a, a more of a marketing feel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. There, uh, again, uh, the student makes an excellent point. You know, it's all about context. And, and if we're thinking about a typical website, typically your aim is going to be much more concise than you would be if you're writing. You know, you, people, you know, uh, the, the old cliche or the old statement is, is that web pages, write on web pages to be scanned instead of to be read quickly, or to be read uh, extensively. Um, generally speaking, people are going to your web page to find something out, all right? And, you know, therefore a bulleted list might be a, a better way to present information than a long narrative. What's the other advantage, or what's the other I, don't, it, I guess it turns out to be an advantage most of the time. But what's the other difference between writing in a, a web page and writing in a magazine? What can you do on a web page that you can't really do in a magazine? Click on a link. Click on a link, exactly. So as far as writing to be scanned goes, you know, if I am talking about several topics, in a magazine, I may explain those topics in some detail. I may explain the first topic, the second topic, the third topic. Which again, for a magazine reader, that's why they bought the magazine, right? Is to read the articles. So they're going to be sitting and reading through, and, and that's okay. For a web page, though, where people tend to be more focused and tend not to be necessarily wanting to immerse themselves and read through volumes of text, but instead they want to get to the answer to their question. So therefore, a bulleted list with maybe some quick information and click here for more information is always sort of a good strategy. It's something that you can imply. So the one thing about websites that you can do that you can't quite as well, quite as effectively do in a magazine is you can present to different levels of detail. All right? In a magazine, an article's an article, right? Now you can put sidebars and you can do other things to maybe add a little bit more detail. But it's very easy on a website to have a summary of information and then links for more detail. And those detail links could have links for more detail still if you wanted to. So one thing that you have on a website, and I would argue that this is a characteristic of a good website is it allows you to examine things to the level of detail you want. All right? So if I'm just interested in an overview, I can get an overview. If I'm interested in some detail or maybe details about one specific aspect of it, I can get that detail. Finally, if I want to see everything in bloody gory detail, I can see all that as well. All right, that's one thing, that the, that's one area where the web is superior to a lot of the other technologies. Is it's much harder to do that sort of thing in, uh, in, in print. Other thoughts about a well or poorly designed website? Is a good website simply a collection of good web pages? In other words, we've, we've described, we've talked about what we think is good about a web page. Is a, is a good website simply a bunch of those good web pages? Or is there something more to it? Not necessarily. Not necessarily? Okay. Exactly. Uh, one thing that comes in when you talk about um, uh, websites as opposed to individual web pages is a navigation. All right. And the navigation... And again, it's listed here, easy to navigate. But 
simplicity, consistency, and readability, which we talked about. are important as well. All right. Consistency in navigation means several different things. All right. First of all, consistency as far as the position of the navigation goes. All right. So if the navigation's in a particular spot, over and over and over, you're teaching people as they're viewing your page how your site's organized. All right. And they're seeing that over and over again. If they're seeing the same thing on every page, they're learning how your site is organized. All right. You know, if we go to a site like Amazon, there are thousands of pages in Am uh, on Amazon sites, hundreds of thousands of pages. But if we look, all of these pages have the same stuff on it as far as navigation goes. So if I go in and I want to look for books, that part stays the same. It's consistent. This varies depending on the section I'm in. If I'm in the section about books, it shows me book links here. If I go up and go to a different department, videos let's say, movies, music. If I go to videos, these links stay the same, but these links are different because they're movie related links. All right. So one of our aims is a consistent navigation. Consistent doesn't mean identical all the time. In other words, it's possible to have a home page that's a little bit different navigation, a little bit different structured navigation than the rest of your pages, simply because the home page serves a different purpose. All right? However, it's important to have some level of consistency. Maybe different sections have a slightly different navigation, but again, there's a main navigation on the top that stays constant. Consistency in language, all right? So, for example, if you call the link movies on one page, you don't call the, na the same navigation link videos on another. Even though you think, hey, that's synonymous, movies, videos. It's not really synonymous. And you're liable to confuse people if you do things in an inconsistent manner like that. All right? So, consistency about appearance, consistency about layout, Consistency about language are all important. All right. We'll continue with this next time, and we'll talk about, given these guidelines, how we can, what's the process for us in developing a website that's going to achieve this. Now, it's funny because most of these guidelines that we have listed here you could argue are pretty common sense, right? They're common sense except when you realize or when you know that if this is just common sense, then why are there so many bad websites out there, right? Obviously, someone's missing the boat somewhere, right? So what we want to focus on is once we've defined these guidelines, we want to focus on the process that's going to get us to creating a site that achieves these guidelines and hopefully will be a well-designed site. So that's sort of what our next step will be. We'll sort of polish this part off, see if, you know, give some thought, see if we have some more ideas as far as what makes good web pages, good websites. Then we'll start talking about a process that's going to put us in that direction. Before we go, if we look, it is running through these browsers. Notice, so far, everything pretty much looks the same. This particular browser, which I, frankly, have never heard of until right this minute, Dillo 3.0.2, 
seems to have a problem with it. It seems to appear a little bit different. Some of these screens look a little different because uh, the image on LC's page rotate. So I wouldn't call that a problem per se. That's just a timing thing. The Lynx browser is an interesting case because the Lynx browser is actually a text-based browser. It doesn't show any images. This is like an old school web browser. So here's, our, here's what our page looks like in a Lynx browser. It's everyone's first, well, I won't say it's everyone's first browser, but that's a lot of people's first browser, especially those of us that, um, well, you and I, we started on computers when we were two, so we're not that old, right? Unix. Exactly. It's the Unix thing. Yep. All right. Uh, that's all I have for today. We'll see you up in lab. Thank you.